Today I'm going to be speaking about Vinny Asaro, who passed away the other day. For those of you not familiar, he was a former captain in the Bonanno family, and at one time sat on a Bonanno ruling panel. Vinny definitely was an old school gangster. As most people know, Ronnie Gialonzo was his nephew, and Ronnie's Vinny's sister's son. Ronnie's father, who everyone calls Richie G, is one of the nicest guys around. When I was young, I remember all the neighborhood social clubs. One in particular belonged to Vinny Asaro, which was on 101st Avenue in Ozone Park, going towards City Line. In fact, it was actually a block away from Giorgio Carrazzo's club. Vinny would do the cooking at his club and was known to be a very good cook. The FBI, knowing he was a banana captain, set up a surveillance post across the street where there used to be a bank. The agent assigned to Vinny was named Richard Taus. One day, Taus was in a room above the bank with a new female agent. At the time, he'd been surveilling Vinny for some years. Back then, the FBI had the manpower to place an agent on individual members. So the female agent walked over to a window and opened the blinds to look out. When she did this, Vinny and a few guys were talking outside the club, and I guess the sun reflected off the blinds, which made them look up. According to Taus, he was pissed because she blew their surveillance post. Immediately after that incident, Vinny no longer spoke to anyone outside his club. Coincidentally, that same agent, Taus, was arrested on November 5, 1988, for sex crimes involving boys who played on a Long Island soccer team that he coached. He would eventually be sentenced to 25 years. Vinny lived off of Pickin Avenue in Ozone Park, and one year, he had a garage full of fireworks that accidentally ignited, and the whole neighborhood was talking about it. He became a member of the Bonanno family in the late 70s, and within two years, he was made a captain, and his reputation preceded him. He was one of those guys who was always yelling and fighting. For example, Vinny loved to gamble, especially on the horses, and in our neighborhood, there was an OTB on Liberty Avenue. For years, Vinny hung out there while placing bets. That isn't to a day when a guy was rooting for another horse, other than the one that Vinny bet. Supposedly, he told the guy to be quiet, but the guy continued to cheer on his horse, so Vinny cracked him. As a result, he was permanently banned from OTB. He was involved in a fence company called Astro Fences in Ozone Park. One day, a friend of mine was driving past the fence company, and he seen Vinny hitting and kicking a much younger guy. At the time, Vinny had a cast on his arm, but that didn't matter to him. Years ago, Vinny had a sit-down with Johnny Cyburns. They met at Erskine Street in Brooklyn which is an area with a bunch of stores. Cyburns told me as soon as he walked over to him, Vinny started yelling and screaming at him. He said all the shoppers stopped and were looking at them. So he tried to tell Vinny to lower his voice and that people were watching, but Vinny kept screaming at him and Cyburns walked away and left. While I was still in prison, my mother had an apartment next to Ciro Perone's club and there was a parking spot in front of the club that was usually safe for Ciro. But when Ciro passed away, from time to time, my mother would park there, and so would one of Ciro's guys named Nolfi. One day, my mother parked in the spot, and Nolfi parked in front of her. But he was too close to the Johnny Pump, which is a fire hydrant, for those of you not familiar. And the cops ticketed his car. A day later, my mother was coming out of the house, and she seen Vinny Asaro double parked. He said hello to her and asked her how she was doing. Just then, Nolfi walked over. And before he got in Vinny's car, he told my mother that she caused him to get a ticket. And Vinny went nuts. He told Nolfi, shut the fuck up and get in the car. My mother walked away laughing. But that just was the way Vinny was. Before I became a member of the Lucchese family, I was an associate of my friend Joey DiBenedetto. And from time to time, I would see Vinny at Howard Beach. Anytime I seen him, he would always tell me that I'm with him. And he did it a lot. Most of the time, I would just laugh. Vinny liked the claim guys. So one day I had to tell him, Vinny, I'm with little Joey. He said, oh, good. Tell little Joey I send my love. And congratulations. <laughs> After I was inducted, I was officially introduced to Vinny as a friend at a party that Joe Cafe had in his yard. At a table talking with Vinny was none other than sideburns. I guess they buried the hatchet. As most people know, Vinny was arrested by the FBI in January 2014. It was a racketeering case that charged him with being part of the infamous Lutanza heist that took place at Kennedy Airport. On December 11, 1978, the sensational heist netted over $5 million in cash and $875,000 in jewelry, all stolen from a vault inside Lufthansa's cargo terminal. 
most of the scene the heist reenacted in the movie Goodfellas. Scores in the airport, especially truck hijackings, went on all the time. The families would assign certain captains to oversee all the airport operations. For example, John Gotti was the Gambino's point man, and Vinny was the Bananos. It was common knowledge that Jimmy Burke and his crew masterminded the heist. Nonetheless, at the very least, the Lucchese and Gambino families took their cut out of the stolen money. On November 9, 2015, a Brooklyn federal jury acquitted Vinny of all the charges, including a murder that took place in 1969. The victim was Paul Katz, and it's alleged that both Vinny and Jimmy Burke killed Katz by strangling him with a dog chain. They suspected him of cooperating. A warehouse in Ozone Park belonging to Katz, which held stolen goods from a hijacking, was raided in 1968. Old Jimmy Burke and Vinny were arrested, and they believed Katz was talking to law enforcement. On December 6, 1969, Katz received a telephone call at his house, a call that obviously made him nervous, and he even told his wife, if I'm not home in a couple of hours, call the cops. His wife suggested that he take one of the kids or even the family dog as protection, but he left his house alone that day and was never seen again. In June of 2013, the FBI dug up a basement to a property owned by Jimmy Burke and found remains belonging to Katz. Supposedly, the body was originally buried in the basement of a vacant house in Queens. But in the mid-80s, Vinnie learned of an investigation into the murder and had the remains moved to the Burke property. This information became known to law enforcement from Vinnie's cousin, Gaspar Valenti, who agreed to cooperate after facing racketeering charges. According to Valenti, he helped bury cats. He also was a government witness at Vinnie's trial. I just want to repeat, I'd like to thank my two lawyers. Without them, I wouldn't be here now. And I'd like to thank U.S. Marshal Service for treating me great. And now I think Mr. Asaro intends to go home and spend Thanksgiving. I got two years here and I'm dying to get home. What are you planning to do? What am I planning to do? Have a good meal. See my family. On March 22nd, 2017, the FBI arrested Vinny again. This time, the charges stemmed from a road rage incident. According to reports, someone cut Vinny off while he was driving in Howard Beach. He then chased after the driver for a while and must have caught the plate number. He later recruited John Gotti, grandson of the former Gambino boss, and two of his friends to find the driver's address, which they tracked to Broad Channel right over the bridge from Howard Beach. Supposedly, they acquired this information from a law enforcement database. Consequently, on April 4, 2012, John Gotti and his friends drove to Broad Channel and lit the car on fire. In December 2017, Vinny pled guilty in the arson case and had to pay $21,000 in restitution for the damage to the car. Before receiving his eight-year sentence, Vinny admitted to the judge that it was a stupid thing that I did. His initial release date was scheduled for 2022, but he was granted compassionate release due to suffering a stroke while incarcerated, and he was released on April 20, 2020. Again, I quickly want to thank all of you who've used the Super Thanks icon. It's greatly appreciated. As I mentioned, Vinny was known to fly off the handle. Conversely, anytime I dealt with him, he was nothing short of being a gentleman. As far as road rage, I've been guilty of it myself. For instance, one day after picking my older daughter up, we were driving down Jericho Turnpike in New High Park, and a van cut me off. I pulled up next to the van, rolled my window down, and said something to the driver. He decided to throw a slice of pizza he'd been eating at my car. So I chased the van down and cut it off. My daughter was begging me not to get out, but I jumped out anyway, and I approached the driver who also got out. To make a long story short, the passenger of the van got out as well. And when he seen his friend in trouble, he tried to get involved. But it didn't go well for either of them. We all do stupid things when we act on impulse. Looking back on it now, I should have never gotten out of my car with my daughter there. At the time, I was a member of the Lucchese family and couldn't let anyone disrespect me. So I guess Vinny felt the same when that driver cut him off. I always liked Vinny. We had some good conversations and we would always make each other laugh. And I hope he rests in peace.